Okay, so what is the internet? Let's just talk about the internet for a second because the, the two terms, the internet and the web are often conflated for good reason. The boundary between the one and the other is becoming a bit blurry. So the internet is the global interconnected network of computers that operate on a standardized set of protocols. What we mean here is that in order for any computer to join the internet, to join this global network, it has to be able to communicate with all the other computers that are already on the internet. And if it doesn't speak the right languages, you know, how can they all communicate with each other? So a big part of the internet is this set of standardized protocols that are really many languages that allow all the computers to know how to speak to all the other computers. They exchange data in a standardized set of protocol. So uh, it's sometimes called the network of networks. This diagram shows you know, little clusters of networks all over the world grouped together. For example, New York University has its own network or networks. The CS department has its own network within the New York University network that is then you know, bundled into a regional network of let's say New York City networks, which then connect to other networks around the country, which have their own sub networks and sub sub networks. For that reason, it's called the network of networks. All these little mini networks all connected together, usually with fiber optic cables. Speaking of cables, so copper wires and, and Wi-Fi signals are the things that we're most used to as people who use the internet. But of course, that's just a tiny fraction of the connectivity, the connective tissue of the internet. So the vast majority of the internet in terms of distance traveled is handled by fiber optic cables. These fiber optic cables, you know, within a region or within the city, they run under the streets or sometimes over the streets. Between regions, between cities, between states, they also of course, have cables uh, either buried or above ground and across oceans. So connecting continents, we have fiber optic cables, you know, layered at the bottom of every ocean, connecting all the continents together. It's kind of an amazing phenomenon. Uh, these aren't just, you know, single threaded uh, fiber optic cables. These are, you know, massive bundles of fiber optic cables that are laid on the on the ocean floor connecting the different continents. So, uh, so you know, th this is this is the nature of the internet. It's this fiber optic primarily connectivity that allows us to all communicate with each other. And we send signals in a standardized set of protocols. And so one computer in the US can easily communicate with another computer in Algeria, for example. By the way, this is a chart, a screenshot of a, a website that is actually kind of interesting to poke around on, a map of submarine cables. So if you ever want to go chop a cable somewhere, well, now you know where they are approximately. Uh, so let's say you were, I don't know, the ruler of Tunisia and you wanted to disconnect your people from the internet, what would you do? You would go slice the cables there and there, boom, you're done. Done. Your people now have no access to Facebook and Twitter, right? Uh, we saw some of that happening in you know, unrest in the Arab Spring, as well as other unrests around the country. That, uh, that that because of these single entry points for connectivity, it's very easy to just go slice off those cables or just turn the switch in the in the buildings where those things connect, and then boom, your people don't have internet connection anymore. It's also easy, of course, in the U.S. to surveil what goes into those points, right? So if you're the NSA or some other intelligence agency, yeah, you want to know what's happening on the internet, you just go plug into the cables where they're coming in from overseas and you get a good amount of information. This is sort of like your... your quick bullet point version of history here. In the 1960s, uh, the D U.S. Department of Defense was concerned about, this is during the Cold War, where the U.S. and the Soviet Union were, you know, at odds with each other, especially with the Soviet Union excelling in certain scientific and engineering endeavors like flights to space. Uh, the U.S. was uh, very much worried about being behind and, and wanted to make sure that we were on par and better than anyone at our at our future proofing of our military. And, uh, and so they started to look into how do you make a computer network resilient to a serious attack like a nuclear attack? With, a, with any kind of a attack, let's say a bomb goes off, you don't want the knocking out of one computer system to disrupt the entire country's computer system, right? So if Texas gets bombed, well, we don't want the whole country to have a lack of communication just because one location was taken out. So with your traditional kind of command and control, you know, centralized uh, network systems, if you knock out the central hub of a network, well, all the other kind of satellite networks wouldn't be able to talk to each other because they all go through the hub to talk to each other. It's like Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat. If those servers go down, Facebook, well, how are people going to get in touch with each other? Most people don't use email anymore. If uh, Snapchat goes down or Twitter goes down, well, how are people going to send messages to each other? Right? They all go through these centralized channels. So we're very much still in the centralized communication universe at, in terms of the applications we use, but the actual infrastructure, the actual networking physical cables are now kind of decentralized. Uh, you can have two different computer systems talk to each other without having to go through one dedicated central hub. And that's a result of this uh, thinking in the Cold War. What happens when you take out one hub? How do we figure out a way to get everything else still communicating? 
In the 70s and 80s, there was a, another defense project. This ARPANET was basically improved the ability for the networks that were in the previous generation to talk to each other. So all different kinds of computer systems around the country and around the world, how do they talk to each other if they're all different kinds, right? So th there wasn't at this point a, a set of standardized protocols as we know it today, but within the very limited world of the US military and academic partnership to, to work on networks, they had done some work to improve the interoperability of different computer systems. In the 80s and 90s, this kind of gradually progressed into what we now call the internet. There were these more standardized protocols that were then suitable for uh, many, many, many different kinds of computer systems talking together. And it became kind of the standard way of talking among computers. So that's where we got the internet, essentially. It started out with defense and then eventually was spread into academia and then into the, the commercial life. The backbone is not controlled by one entity. So the main fiber optic cable bundles that are laying across the U.S. or laying across the world are not controlled by just one government or one company or one academic institution, right? So there's a partnership of many different institutions. Primarily, you have, at least in the U.S., you have um, telecommunications companies. There are, I think, six companies that control the vast majority of the actual fiber optic cables in the U.S. Um, you also have some being run by government at different levels of government in the U.S. And you do have some academic institutions with significant amounts of cabling as well. So the backbone, meaning these main fiber optic lines that connect the parts of the U.S. here, um, at least in the U.S., are divided up into these three different kinds of ownership. So how do they all talk to each other? Given that you have all these different organizations, academic, military, government, and uh, commercial, you know, how do they all, how does the data from one network go into the other network's cables and then from there go into another company's cables and get to its final destination? So there's cooperation. Um, organizations of about equal size have what they call a free, free pairing agreement where they agree to let data from one network pass across another network on its way to its destination for free. And companies, organizations that are of very different sizes will have paid arrangements where one of them might pay the other to allow the data from its network to travel across the other's network. So this is the you know, general, general concept of how this works. There, there are legal contracts signed by these telecommunications and other companies that allow data from the one to pass and use the fiber optic cables of the other to get to its destination. Uh, without those agreements, this wouldn't work. When we're talking about control, we just mentioned there's no one entity that controls all this network infrastructure. Very often we, we say that the internet was a democratic force in society. We often talk about that. It's just generally considered to be a disruptive force, whether that's for democracy or against democracy. Back in the earlier days, I'm talking around the, the late 90s, early 2000s, to maybe 2010, the internet was seen as a democratizing force, right? Allowing people, anybody to talk to anybody else, allowing different groups to self-organize, you know, get in touch with one another, organize protests, organize get-togethers of all different kinds to promote basically people's agency, people's feeling of control over their own life. That view has shifted around, you know, 2010 or so. The, you know, the complications of that view became apparent. You had these phenomena, you know, in the 2010s of like the Arab Spring and other uprisings where it was said that Twitter and Facebook were helping people self-organize to promote democracy. But then, you know, a couple of years down the road, you see what happened and you say, well, actually, it didn't really work out that way. Uh, the, the Internet allowed people to self-organize, sure, but that also allowed massive surveillance of those people. People were able to self-organize and, and determine their own agendas at the same time, their internet, once it's cut off, leaves them somewhat powerless, right? So there are these complicated issues, uh, including the privatization of much of this, meaning that private companies are surveilling and, and selling the data from the people who are using services on the internet, uh, creates a complicated picture where it's not clear that there's a, you know, a benefit. It's, I've watched a, a lecture by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. Uh, we'll talk about him in a second, where he, he, uh, you know, he was asked a question, which is, you know, so what do you, where do you think it's netted out from zero being a negative for society to 10 being a, a positive for democracy and society? Uh, and he puts it at a six currently. So he says, you know, you're, we're not even, uh, you know, the, the bad parts and the good parts aren't even, but a little bit tilted towards the good at this point. But he's not so positive on the way things have turned out for the web. And that I think reflects generally on the internet. All right, so we have this uh, kind of information situation where information is getting passed all around the world along these cables and these computer systems. 
And that allows anyone to share information, also to steal information, to surveil and influence elections and populations. Uh, and there's really a war right now for information dominance. This is, you know, the new style of cyber warfare is information dominance warfare. You know, can you inject the false narrative into your enemy's election process to disrupt it, right? That is uh, even more powerful in some ways than a military war in the traditional sense. So people are predicting that that, that is, you know, well, people have been predicting this for many years before, but now, especially with the more recent elections and, and issues in the U.S., you know, it's, it's here. It's now sort of established itself as a force in international competition, this idea of false narratives and cyber warfare. All right, so where does the web fit into this? The web is one use, one application of the internet. It's one thing you can do now that you have this interconnected network globally. Hypertext is the, the kind of documents that you browse when you're browsing the web. So when you're browsing the web, you're browsing hypertext documents. You're looking at documents that then link to other documents. Uh, that idea comes back from 1945, the idea of documents that link to other documents. There is, and I've linked to it here, there is a uh, article by Vannevar Bush, who was the head of scientific research in the U.S. military. Uh, in 1945, he, it's this sort of post his efforts in the war, so post-World War II efforts to sort out the world's information. And he came up with this concept. He didn't call it hypertext, but now we call it hypertext, which is documents that have links and references to other documents. So a lot of, again, the, the, the web and the internet, a lot of this comes back to military technology, military thinking, and this is another example. So the web goes back to 1945 conceptually. This idea wasn't implemented in a way that was approachable by the average person until Sir Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. Uh, but that concept of documents linking to each other that's you know more than a half century old at this point. Um, so he was in the war effort. Then when that was more or less over, shifted his thinking to information overload. And imagine what information overload meant in 1945, right? Um, you know, before personal computers, before cell phones, before the internet, uh, what did they even mean when they were talking about information overload? It must have been a joke compared to what we have now in terms of how many publications are, are just published every day all over the world on the web. So even then they recognized the need for some way of finding stuff in that mess of information that to us now probably looks like a tiny needle compared to our haystack of information that we have. So the World Wide Web that we know today that we love is invented by um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He's now Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He's been knighted by the Queen of um, Britain. But uh, in, in 1989, he made a proposal to his boss. He said he wanted to you know, try out working on this idea he had. His boss actually wasn't so interested in that idea, but wanted him to learn how to use a, a new kind of computer called the Next Computer. And so gave him some time to work on his idea with the, you know, with the understanding that he would be working on that idea in order to just try out this new kind of computer and see how it goes. Uh, but ends up he did something quite valuable with that time. Um, so he, he attributes the invention to a mashup of existing concepts. So he, so he took some existing concepts of hypertext. He was aware of Vannevar Bush's document from 1945. Uh, he was aware that the internet was at that point in existence. People were already sending information to each other over the internet, but it wasn't a mass consumable product. And uh, there, was new, there were new developments in monitors and computer screens and multi-font text. So he took those three things, you know, hypertext, internet, m displays of more than just black and white text uh, with a single font and, uh, and created the World Wide Web out of that. It sounds like simple and he's very humble, you know, oh, I just took the three things that already existed. But, you know, in fact, what he did is he invented the language HTML, which even today we still use to program web pages. He invented the first web browser. He invented the first web server that could give documents to web browsers. He invented the communications protocols that servers and browsers use to communicate HTTP. So really, you know, this is a lot of work that he did to, to actually implement his vision, uh, which Yes, it may have been based on existing technologies and existing thoughts, but obviously took some abstract thinking to put those things together and then actually hard coding all those different technologies. Uh, it was, of course, released open source and free. He was very much inspired by the open source movement before it was known by that term. Uh, earlier on, it was known as the free software movement. So he was influenced by that. I'm linking here to a discussion on YouTube where he discusses the current state of the web and his thoughts on that. So feel free to check that link out if you're interested. It used to be easy to say the World Wide Web was the use of the internet to browse hypertext documents. Uh, that used to be what it is, but today it's a bit more complex. We have not just web browsers anymore, right? When you install your TikTok, 
is that a web browser? No, not really. It's a native application that gives you only one kind of information, only one kind of hypertext document. Certainly what you're looking at when you're using TikTok or Facebook or Snapchat are hypertext documents. You often have links to other, other documents within those apps. Um, so there's at least some hypertext aspect to all those different pages or documents that you look at in those apps. But you wouldn't really call those web pages. Like you wouldn't look at your TikTok screen and think it's a web page traditionally. But no, nevertheless, it is a tool used to look at content that has links to other content. So it is in some ways an implementation of this same idea, but you wouldn't necessarily call it the web. You also have what used to be called the web, the use of hypertext documents and HTTP protocol to exchange information uh, is actually now being used for more than just looking at webs, web files. So you have uh, HTTP, this web protocol where servers and clients can talk to each other used for transferring files, sending messages, simple messages, doing Zoom calls, and, uh, and much more than what you would have called the web beforehand. So hypertext is used by many programs that are not web browsers. The protocol that used to be a web protocol is now used by many for many other purposes as well. And other protocols can do now what the web HTTP used to do. So you have uh, web sockets and other protocols that can now do what HTTP used to do with some differences in, in why you would use them, but still nevertheless can be used for that purpose. So it's become a bit, a bit blurry, the line between these other apps and things and the web. Things that used to be the internet, but not the web, like transferring files, can now be done on the web. The phases of the web. So people often divide the history of the web into three different phases. And I just wanna go through kind of what are the aspects of each of them. The first phase of the web is what you might've called the web 1.0. And that would have been static content. That would have been content where you don't really interact with it. You just look at a web page, you read what's there, and that's pretty much it. You know, Maybe you could send an email to somebody who had made that web page but that wasn't the, the purpose in any way of the web at the early days. It was just looking at a document, reading that document, having links to other documents, but no further interaction but, but except clicking on a link. So you might, have, you might call this passive consumption of web content. That was the definition of the web 1.0 phase. That would have been you know, from the beginning of the web up until let's say around 2005, 2003, where you started to see more um, engaging interactive content on the web. So around you know, early 2000s anyway, you had um, user generated content would made, made a big entrance. That was you know blogs where anybody could comment on the blog post. Um, you had photo sharing where anybody could post a photo and share it on a website. So it wasn't just the authors of the website, the creators of the website who were publishing content, but it was their users, the visitors to those web pages could also partake in publishing content to the web pages. And of course, that's where the massive data collection really began. Once the users were engaging more with the, um, with the content and publishing content, well, then you can see what is it they're publishing it. You know, what are they interested in? What words are they using? Who are they sending messages to through our websites, right? So you can start to track and monetize and sell a user behavior. So that was the era of active participation where blogging, photo sharing, messaging through the web all started to take place and data collection and surveillance, of course. We are now what some people are calling in the era of web three. I think it's premature to say that we're necessarily fully in it, but we're at what some people believe is the beginning of the web three phase. Many people, not just me, are recognizing the ill effects uh, of the way that the web is being used and, and, and created at the moment. The dominance of a few tech companies over just about everybody else's websites. Try and find a website that doesn't have some Google code on it. You'll have a hard time doing that, right? So Google is really surveilling just about every website that you're likely to visit. And you have Amazon controlling commerce on the web for whatever reason. A lot of our communications and usage of the web has become highly centralized through a couple of tech companies that are then monetizing everybody's information. There's issues of privacy, issues of monopoly powers and so on, and the effect that that has on the people using it. You're used to now having surveillance uh, on everyday activities. So many people are recognizing that this is not what was the intention of the web. You know, Sir, T Sir Tim did not ever imagine that this would be what was happening with the beautiful thing that he created. So you have people creating decentralized ways of communicating that don't go through these central tech companies. So you have decentralized distributed protocols that are being invented today that are, in some people's minds, setting the stage for a more decentralized future of the web where you don't have all your information funneled into these um, psychophantic 
tech companies. It, you know, examples of some of these technologies that have made a big splash anyway, there are many others, but the ones that have gotten a lot of recognition are, of course, Bitcoin and Ethereum, these cryptocurrency um, inventions, and the IPFS file system. This is a file system, you know, imagine you use Dropbox or, or Google Drive to share your documents or you post your documents to a web server, a web host like Amazon. So you have uh, you know, centralized hosts, centralized ways of sharing files, but you also have decentralized ways like torrent and, and in this case, IPFS is a kind of a file system that is actually spread out on many people's computers. So you can post a file onto this file system that doesn't exist in one place, but exists distributed across many computers just regular people's computers. It's an amazingly interesting technology. So there are all these kind of foundational technologies being built right now that are setting the stage for a fully functioning, fully decentralized, distributed way of using the web. I think that's super interesting personally. So what is a client? What is a server? We'll be using these terms all the time. You've probably used them yourselves many times before. A client is any machine on a network that is requesting data from a server. That's the only definition of a client. It's a, it's a computer that's asking for something from another computer on a network. A server is the computer that responds to that request. So your client asks for something from the server and the server responds to the client. Imagine you're at a restaurant. You would have a server usually. You'd say, give me my you know, mocha frappuccino latte, please. And they would go and get it and give it to you, right? So you're the client, they're the server. And that's why they're often called servers is because they serve to the clients what the client requests. So that dynamic is exactly the same uh, in networks as it is in commerce. Often, if not, you know, more and more increasingly often, you have a single machine sometimes acting the role of both a client and a server at different times or in different interactions. So my computer might be connecting to your computer and asking for something, where in that case, my computer is the client, your computer is the server. At the same time, somebody else's computer might be asking my computer for something. So at the same time that I'm a client in my interaction with you, I'm a server in an interaction with somebody else's computer. You know, these aren't mutually exclusive. You can be both a client and a server, but in any single interaction, you're either the client or you're the server and not both. So it's really a role you're playing in a single interaction. That doesn't define all of your capabilities, but just defines your capabilities in that particular interaction. How does this work? When you're on the web or on the internet, just generally, or on the network, just generally, your computer, uh, specifically a certain program on your computer, like the web browser, makes a request to a server, right? So that's the, the big picture idea. Your computer sends out a little request, hey, please give me something. Shoots that over to the server. Right? The server then can decide what to do in response. So the server will then shoot back a response that says, okay, you asked for something, here you go, right? So it sends something back to the client. So imagine you're asking for the homepage of uh, nyu.edu, right? That web page. Your your browser on your computer is asking you know nyu.edu for the homepage, and nyu. That should be you. edu is shooting back to you the homepage. Yes, maybe, or maybe not shooting back to you the homepage and some error message saying sorry, you're not authorized to access this or you know, the page you're looking for is not available. You know, there are error messages when the thing that's being requested is deemed not you know, appropriate. The server can respond with a, a negative answer, which is, sorry, you wanted this thing, but I'm not giving it to you, right? So not, don't assume that all requests are actually responded positively. It's up to the server to decide how to respond to the client. Um, typically a server, you know, like nyu.edu or any other would be dealing with many different clients at the same time. So imagine this is you know me over here, that's you, that's somebody else, somebody else, somebody else. Yeah, we're all making requests to this same server at the same time potentially, or at different times also. And the server is has to figure out you know how to handle all this stuff and how to you know give each person what they're asking for, uh, which is you know one of the challenges of server design is making sure that they can handle all those requests. There's also this peer-to-peer -peer way of having client-server communications, which uh, would be where, where you, there is no central server that everybody is sending their requests to, but they send their requests to other peers, other regular computers on the network. So in you know, file sharing like BitTorrent or in cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and, and Bitcoin, you've got peer-to-peer -peer networking where the people on the network are shooting messages directly to each other, not through some central server. 
Um, it's still a request response, right? So each peer on the network at any given moment is, you know, let's say making a request. So this one would be the client here. I can write that small, but this one would be the server in this particular interaction, right? Once the server responds, well, that interaction might be over and this peer might be considered a server because this one is making a request to it, right? So the same server, the same uh, computer that was a client a second ago, uh, you know, could be a, a server in a different moment. So peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and peer-to-peer and -peer cryptocurrencies all work this way, which is no centralized server, but everyone is a client and a server on that network. Uh, so, you know, as with Web3, this is sort of becoming more common, these kinds of ways of doing things. You'll often hear about the layered architecture of the internet and on, of networks in general. So let me just run through kind of uh, some of the, the protocols, the languages that are being used to allow computers to interact with each other. Uh, we don't usually have to get into this as application programmers, but just some understanding doesn't hurt of where these things live. Um, so you have in the, um, in the world of these uh, layers, you have at the very bottom, you have your local network in your home or in your office or in your building, wherever you are. Um, and there are a variety of different protocols that allow the computers within a certain local network to communicate. Uh, Ethernet is one, Wi-Fi, 802.11. Um, and others are small scale local um, communications among computers, it, all connected to the same Wi-Fi hub or the same router in a room. Assuming that that's in place, the computers in that network in that small local network can shoot messages out to the internet. And that is allowed by the internet protocol. So you've all heard of IP addresses, right? That, that every computer has a certain address associated with it. Well, that's because of the internet protocol. And one of the requirements of it is that each computer has its own unique numeric address. And, uh, and so when you want one computer on the internet to shoot a message to another, it has to know the address where it wants to send the message. Uh, so, so that's about addressing messages and making sure messages are going to the right place. And then you have a kind of a, a, a more abstract layer, which is the, um, the transport layer. So typically what we do on the web is use TCP. So uh, in TCP, this is where you get into kind of checking that the message actually has gotten sent. So the IP allows messages to be addressed to a certain place and the TCP kind of allows some checking on that. You know, did it really get there? Do we have to resend any of those little bits that were lost on the way somewhere? Um, so it's a bit of a more controlled um, uh, double checking on, on the data that's sent by IP. And then once you have that in place, and you, so you've got your local network connected to the internet, you've got the ability to address using IP messages to some other computer on the internet. You've got TCP, which allows some checking of that message sent. And, uh, and once you have that all in place, well, then you can build your applications, right? Then you can go and send information about web pages, about file transfer, about email messages. You can do all the applications we know we can do on the internet because all those other layers below are in place. Right. So each one of these layers depends upon the layers below it in order to function. That's the, the big picture idea here. So when we're working on applications, we're working on you know, this topmost layer only. And, uh, and we're assuming everything else down there is you know, working fine. So let's just talk about HTTP. HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol that allows servers and clients to communicate with each other. Uh, I'm just going to jump into what some of these messages look like. Every message in HTTP has a certain code associated with it. So when your client sends a message to a server, so let's say again, I have a client somewhere. This is my computer, that's the client, sends a message to the server, right? There's a certain response that the server sends back and that has a numeric component. So if it's anywhere from 200 to 299, let's say it's a 200, that's good success. That means, yes, we got your request, here's the response. If instead it was a, I don't know, a 599, well, that is in the error um, range. And that would indicate that something happened on the server that wasn't right. There was an error of some kind on the server. Sorry, we didn't get a chance to fulfill your request. Here you go, you got nothing that you wanted, right? So depending upon the number that comes back, you can tell on the client side whether the server is giving you back what you wanted, whether a problem happened on the server or whether something happened on your client that was wrong or whether everything's good and you're getting the response that you asked for. All right, so the client has the ability to read these status codes 
and determine whether or not the server is sending back what was requested. Here's an example of a certain kind of a request called a get request that a client, meaning like a web browser, could send to a server. So you see some key components here. You've got the file that is being requested from the server right there. Like that You've got the user agent. That is an identification of which browser you're using. So if you're on, let's say, Google Chrome, this might be what you're your user agent would look like. And I, I don't think this is the Google Chrome one. This looks like it's the Internet Explorer. But still, this would be something like an identification code for your, your browser that you're using. So your browser is telling the server what kind of browser it is. Interestingly enough, all of the browsers say that they're part of Mozilla. They are the creators of Firefox. It's a nonprofit organization uh, that creates technologies that are open source like Firefox. They have an email client I think they still make called Thunderbird uh, and various other programs they have and, and funds they have to give to people who are trying to democratize the internet and, and, and spread their source code for the love of humankind. So it's a nonprofit kind of philanthropic organization. Why would Google be telling servers that it's part of the Mozilla nonprofit organization? Anybody? They do, trust me, we can look at it ourselves. The answer is back in the early days of the web, back in the late 90s, there was a company called Netscape that made a web browser called Netscape. It was the first good web browser. It worked really well. It was reliable. It could reliably show you the HTML code rendered nicely on the web page. Um, and there were other browsers made by other people like Microsoft and in, in that era that didn't work very well. So Netscape was this the latest, greatest late 90s web browser. And other browsers would not necessarily get back the content that Netscape would get back when it asked for something from the server. So remember that the, the client sends a message requesting something from a server, and the server then sends something back, right? But it doesn't have to be that the server sends the same thing back to every browser. So you might be a Netscape getting something back over there, but this other computer that's running, I don't know, IE, Internet Explorer, would get back something different from the server. So server has the intelligence to be able to do whatever it wants, right? It can give back one piece of content to one browser, another piece of content to another browser. The browsers are all identifying themselves. And so the server has the right to say, oh, you're Mozilla here, we're going to give you this, or oh, you're Internet Explorer, we'll give you that. Uh, and that used to happen very frequently because the Netscape browsers were better than the others. And so the web servers would send back you know, the best version of the pages back to Netscape browsers, but you know, poorer quality, simpler versions to Internet Explorer and others that couldn't render them correctly. And so a lot of the browsers just started to pretend like they were Netscape in order to get the good quality stuff from the server. So they all just shot out you know, fake messages that they're part of Netscape. Uh, in order to get back the good stuff from the server. So tricking the server into sending them the good stuff that they would then, of course, mess up. The word Mozilla was an internal code word within Netscape. Netscape was created by the same people who then went and took all the Netscape work and turned it into a nonprofit that we call Mozilla today. So that word is still present in the Mozilla organization as their word for their browser, but it did originate back inside the world of Netscape. So anyway, that's the history of it. So even today, 25 years later, all the browsers are still pretending to be the Netscape browser. And why is that? You know, that goes into legacy technology. There's still servers probably that still give the good stuff to Netscape and the bad stuff to others. And so they all are still pretending to be the old Netscape for whatever reason. Uh, changing code is hard if you have a lot of other code that depends upon a code being a certain way. Here is a uh, another kind of request called a post request. So there are really two major kinds of requests, get and post. Uh, with the post request, you have this optional ability to include some data down in the, uh, in, in the message area of the request. So here we can have a certain payload underneath the request. That wasn't present in the other version, right? So when you did the a GET request, if you're doing a GET request, you don't have that payload area, but with a POST request, you do. So the POST request allows the browser to send some additional information to the server that isn't part of the regular HTTP stuff. Uh, all the regular HTTP stuff is what's up in the top here, this set of what we call headers. And uh, that's present in both GET and POST, but the payload is only present in the post version. Um, so I can send additional information to the browser, uh, to the server, I'm sorry. I can send my, you know, let's say my name, uh, what is my name, or the topic that I'm interested in, or whatever you want. You can shoot off to the server whatever custom attributes you want it to know about. And the server, if it's programmed to do so, can read these things and decide to send you something different depending upon what you put in those little parameters. Um, so post requests allow you this additional layer of data sending from the client, the browser, to the server that isn't present 
uh, in Git. The server will then usually respond to that. This would be a, a response from the server. These are the HTTP kind of headers, these behind the scenes little codes that the server sends back to the client. Notice the number in my example is 200. That's a good, okay response. That means the server has successfully processed the request and has sent back what the client requested. Uh, and so it sends some information. It sends what kind of server it is, Apache in this case, that's a kind of web server. Uh, when this document was modified, how many bytes are in this document? Uh, what kind of document is it, HTML? And that's it. And here's the payload down here uh, from the server. And that's the actual HTML code that the web browser then uses to display something to the user. So that's it. The client makes the request. The request is processed by the server and the server then shoots a response back to the browser with a status code and whatever payload it decides upon. On the front end, the term front end is used to, to mean the, the program that is acting as the client. So it's, a, it's a, a, in other words, a synonym for client. So on the front end of a web interaction, um, you've got a bunch of different languages that are used to show the user of a web browser what, what the content is that they should be seeing. Uh, we have HTML, cascading style sheets, and JavaScript. Those are three primary technologies that are languages that are used to tell the browser what to show a user. HTML, in case anyone has not had any exposure to it, HTML is, uh, is a way of indicating the content of a web page, but also the meaning of the content. So we're going to have the word Jabberwocky, but that word will be a heading because this is a heading tag. We'll have the words Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toes did Gyre and Gimble in the Wave, but that will be a paragraph because we're surrounding that in paragraph tags. Uh, another tag is an A tag that says that this text will be on the page, but it will be an anchor, which is a kind of a, which is a, a link, a hypertext link. So you'll be able to click that and go somewhere. Uh, and this text will be a paragraph, right? So not only do you have the content that will be on the page, but you have the purpose of that content indicated with these little codes called tags. All right, another language on the client side, on the browser that is used to, to you know, render the pages to the vis visitor is uh, cascading style sheets. And that's used to indicate the style of what is shown to the user. So HTML is what content is shown and CSS is how is that gonna look? So for example, here we say display none. That's a CSS code that looks for any HTML code with the ID P2. So notice that there is an ID P2 here in the HTML. The CSS is saying, don't display that, right? So just don't show that up at all. There's another one down here that says, look for the HTML code with the ID more and make it red with no underlining. Here we have a paragraph with the ID more. And so this is a link, a tag is a hypertext link. And so the, the CSS code is saying, go find this element in the HTML and make it color red, that's the text color, and make it not have the normal underlining that links have. So CSS again is the styling language. It works in tandem with the HTML. The HTML says, what's the content and what is the meaning of the content? And the CSS says, how each of those pieces of content should look. Colors, what borders, what rotations they should have, anything stylistic that you wanted applied to the content would be written up in cascading style sheets code. So it's not the most complicated language either. HTML is even simpler. CSS is a little bit more complicated, but not much. And then you get to JavaScript, and this is used to interact, uh, to, to, to apply interactive behaviors to the page. So again, we have this link in the HTML with the ID more. In JavaScript code, this says, go find the, the thing in the HTML with the ID more. And when it's clicked, run this function that shows paragraph two. So go find paragraph two and show it. Uh, again, I'm using very simple code here just to give you a flavor for what you do with these technologies, right? So HTML is the content, CSS is the style, and JavaScript is interactive behaviors. What happens when you click on something or you mouse over something or swipe something? So all the things that are interactions that are user-driven would be indicated in JavaScript. So it's the three front-end technologies. And that means that it's the web browser that runs this code. Web browser interprets HTML, converts it to content on the page. Web browser reads CSS and styles the HTML based on what the rules say in CSS. And it's the web browser that reads the JavaScript and creates the interactive behaviors in the web browser based on the code here. Nothing here has to do with a server. These are technologies that live and are read and interpreted by the web browser. And that's an important distinction. The server may be sending these files, the HTML files, the CSS files, the JavaScript files. The server may be sending those to the web browser when the web browser asks for them, uh, but it's ultimately the web browser that will be running those codes and interpreting those codes 
uh, that are written in these three kinds of files. It's the web browser that is interpreting this code. And that's an important distinction because different web browsers might do it differently. So your one web page that you've written in HTML and CSS and in JavaScript may look one way on a certain browser and a different way on a different browser because it's the browsers that are doing the interpretation of that same code. And they might interpret it differently. These days, your different web browsers like Google Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer, Brave, these web browsers are almost all very, very, very similar, but they will have small differences in how they interpret the code still. But they're, they're much less than they used to be in the late 90s when everyone was pretending to be Netscape. This was a much bigger problem. The difference in interpretation among the different browsers was a much bigger problem than it is today. It's, it's today very much standardized. So you do have frameworks that we use to write front end code in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What is a framework? It's kind of ready-made code. So you don't have to write everything from scratch. You just download someone else's code that does a lot of useful stuff for you. So one of the things people like to use a lot is Bootstrap. This is a set of code originally made by Twitter that gives you some nice styling of uh, content. So a nice CSS code that makes your pages look pretty and, um, and will often uh, allow your pages to easily be responsive so that if you're on a mobile phone where your screen is very narrow or you're on a tablet where your screen is medium size, or you're on a desktop computer where your screen is wider, uh, the styling will be consistent. So that's called responsive design. So Bootstrap is a very popular set of ready-made code. It's mostly CSS code, but has some JavaScript code there as well that allows your HTML code to look nice without you having to style yourself in CSS and actually adapt to the screen width pretty easily. So it's a, it's a very popular framework for those purposes. Same uh, concept, really. Uh, Google has a, a framework, a set of ready-made code, code called Material UI that does very much the same thing um, as Bootstrap. Uh, it's made by Google and is specifically designed to work with React. What is React? It is a framework originally made by Facebook that attempts to step away from HTML and CSS and JavaScript to some degree, at least as they are as they are interpreted by the browser and allows you to write JavaScript code, almost purely JavaScript code, that then is used to generate the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript that the browser will interpret. So you just write a program essentially that spits out the HTML and CSS and JavaScript that will be seen by the browser. But you're gonna write it in just JavaScript in a certain style that React says to write it in so that it can generate those three kinds of files for the browser properly. So in this case, you're using JavaScript as a kind of a general purpose programming language, not because the browsers understand JavaScript, but just because it's a useful language to program in, you're gonna write some code in JavaScript that then creates HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. AngularJS is a Google made competitor to React. Uh, these days, it seems to be much less popular than React. All right, on the back end, what is the back end? The back end is the server. So, so we've just talked about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are the languages understood by your browser. Uh, these tools, Bootstrap, Material UI, React, Angular, and others can help you write that code more quickly because they give you ready-made libraries of code. Um, on the back end, you have a similar setup. You've got actually a, a wider variety of programming languages that you can um, that you can use. So the server side has PHP, Ruby. Python, JavaScript, Java-based servers. So actually, it's the, the, the set of languages you can use is far greater in, in diversity on the server side than on the client side, which is all just HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So the server controls what the client receives. Remember that the server responds to client requests. So for example, what can you do on server? If you know that the user is using a browser with a language setting to Spanish, you could send a Spanish version of a web page rather than an English version, right? So you can detect because the browser, remember, sends some information to the server in the HTTP headers. It sends some information to the server about what browser is being used, but also some of the settings on that browser. One of those settings is the language that's preferred. And so the server can look at that, the, that incoming request from the browser, see which language is preferred, and shoot back a version of a web page in the proper appropriate language. So that's one example of you know, the server making a decision, not just sending back the same thing to everybody, but detecting some information about the client and sending back a different response based on that contextual information. You could also send back a mobile version of a web page, you know, a page optimized, meaning designed specifically to look nice on mobile phones rather than a version of the page that's designed to look good on wider screens if you know that the user is on a mobile device, which you can see from those little messages, those HTTP headers that the browser sends to the server. When you go to a news site like New York Times or Washington Post or wherever you read news, when you go to that same web page, you often see different stuff. 
right? One day you'll see one list of articles and then tomorrow you'll see a different list of articles on that same web page. It's not as if somebody is going in every night and reprogramming those web pages. That's not how it works. The web page is actually designed to dynamically on the fly pull data from a database and show you whatever is in that database. And whenever people write new articles and put them in that database, well, that's what you're going to see next time you go to that web page. So the web page stays the same. It's just that the, the data that's being put into the web page comes from a dynamic list of articles in a database, and, uh, and it's coded to read from that database and shoot the results back to you. So that's a, an example of coding a dynamic site on a server. The server, again, doesn't have to same, send the same stuff to the client every single time it's requested. Another example of things you can do on the server side. So you know when you go to your Amazon cart and uh, the things that you saved are there, right? How does that work? How does Amazon know which stuff you saved into your cart versus versus which stuff I saved into my cart. And wouldn't it be terrible if it showed you my cart instead of your cart next time you went to Amazon, right? So how does it keep track of whose stuff is whose and, uh, and show you the right stuff? So on the server, you have ways of tracking users and remembering in a database or some permanent data storage area, which person, meaning which web browser has asked for which things in their cart. So these are again, server side things. It's not as if every time you put a new product in your Amazon cart, some poorly paid programmer in a developing country is going and updating the HTML code. That's not the way it works. There's a dynamic server-side coding system that is used to track you and keep track of which things you've clicked the add to cart button on and store those things in a database and then check that database. Next time you ask for that page, plug the right products into the HTML that then gets sent back to the browser that you look at. What are the languages that we use for server-side programming? Well, just some popular ones here. Node. Uh, which is JavaScript, Ruby, Python, PHP, C Sharp, ASP. I'd add Java to this list as well. There, you could add just about any high level programming language to this list. You can make servers with just about any of these web servers. You usually, like with the front end, you often use frameworks. You don't usually write your code from scratch with no ready made code libraries. So if you're writing a web server in Node.js, you typically use the Express ready made library. If you're writing code in Ruby, you typically use the Rails framework. If you're writing code in Python, you'd use Django or Flask, PHP, Laravel or Symfony, C Sharp, the .NET framework, ASP, the .NET framework, um, Java. You have various frameworks like Spring. So you have um, uh, you know, a variety of kind of ready-made code libraries that help you, you know, do a lot of the work for you. So your code can focus on the things that are different about your web server, not the things that all web servers share in common. Those would be handled by these frameworks. Let's talk briefly about databases. Databases used to store data and particularly to give you fast access to, to lots of data. And the, the key concept is when you go to a website, so you're the human, you're using your computer, which has a browser. Your computer is sending a request to the server. The server will shoot a request to the database for some information, like give me the latest news articles for today. The database will respond with those news articles for today, and the server will then put those into HTML and shoot those back down to the browser, which then shows them to you, right? So that's the way this all kind of fits together. Client makes requests to server, server connects to database, database sends some data back to the server, server puts that into a nice HTML file, shoots that back to the client, the browser shows you what's in that HTML file. So a lot of the data, but not all the data, is stored in databases on a web application. So what kinds of databases can you use? Well, there are really two camps of databases, uh, the kind that use the SQL language and the kind that don't. So here are just some examples of databases that you can, you can make requests to them, and you can have the server send requests to the database in SQL. Oracle, Microsoft SQL, PostgreSQL, MySQL, Amazon Aurora, and many others exist in this space of databases that are of the relational type, which all use the same language internally called SQL, simple query language. The other camp of databases would be called NoSQL. And why are they called NoSQL? You can guess, is because they don't use the SQL language internally. So there's a movement in many camps, there's a movement away from SQL. Uh, these kinds of databases are, you know, the old school type that have been around since the 70s. And uh, this is a newer generation of databases that have, you know, features that are a little bit more attractive to app developers. So one of the things that people like about MongoDB and many of the others is that web developers, application developers already know JavaScript. 
you can't really be an application developer and not have any understanding of JavaScript. So if you're going to use JavaScript as your internal language on the database, well, then you don't have to learn something new, right? A developer who's new to this, they already know some JavaScript. They can use that on the database. They don't have to learn SQL, this old archaic looking language. If for no other reason, that's one of the reasons why MongoDB is super popular. There is a trend to serverless databases. This is a bit of a misnomer because there is a server, but you, you're just kind of bundling up the server and the, the database together. So, so you might actually have the server kind of just moved into this world of database. So you do have some server logic, some server programming, but it's not a separate system from the database. It's all part of the database system together. Uh, but you'll see that as a trend, that this idea of serverless programming. You no longer need this back end. You can just directly connect to the database. And that's all true, but that's because the database is handling a lot of the same tasks that servers, separate servers used to handle. There is front end storage and here's where I get to cookies. So, um, so these are little bits of information that the server tells the browser to hold on to for tracking. You also have an additional area of storage in the browser that is uh, for bigger chunks of data called local storage. So from the JavaScript code that the browser understands, you can write code in that JavaScript that puts things or retrieves things from an area of memory in the browser called local storage. So the server can send JavaScript code to the client that the client then uses to, to know what to do in the local area of storage. 